Okay, uh, we're glad to have uh, Martin give us his third lecture on lumps and vortices. Uh, thank you very much. So after Oscar's uh, very beautiful and very high powered lecture earlier today, we're gonna to come back down to earth with a bump. We're gonna talk about vortices on the T-sphere. Okay, so the setup has already been uh, introduced in Oscar's first lecture actually, but let me remind you of it because um, that was a while ago. So what we have is a complex line bundle over a compact Riemann surface. And the compact Riemann surface for me is always going to be diffeomorphic to the two-sphere, but I'm not necessarily gonna assume that it's the round two-sphere. So I'm going to allow the two-sphere to have an arbitrary Riemannian metric on it, okay? But it's an oriented two-sphere. And we need each fiber of this uh, line bundle to have a Hermitian inner product on it. So it's a Hermitian line bundle. Let me call the Hermitian inner product H. And we'll call the degree of this line bundle, which other people have been calling D, is going to be N. That's going to be the vortex number. Okay. So uh, our fields consist of a section of this bundle and a unitary connection on that bundle. Okay. So we have phi, a section of the bundle, and A, a connection on the bundle. I think people usually write that sort of script, script A. And to any such pair, we associate a natural energy functional. Uh, plus one eighth tau minus phi squared. T1 squared. And as Oscar did, I'm introducing a parameter here, a real parameter, tau bigger than zero. Okay, so that's the energy. That's the sort of yang mills higgs energy. And the point is that we have this Bogomolny argument, um, which says that the energy is bounded below by pi times tau times n with equality, if and only if, a nice pair of equations holds. So if and only if phi is holomorphic with respect to the holomorphic structure defined by the connection. Uh, and the curvature of this connection, which before I was thinking of as being the magnetic field. Okay, so that's a two form. And I'm choosing, I'm choosing the obvious is, um, isomorphism between the, the algebra of U, of U1 and the real line. Okay, so I'll think of this as being a real two form. Okay, so these are the vortex equations. And if we can find a solution to them, um, then that solution minimizes energy in its, in its topological class. Okay, and such solutions are called vortices, end vortices. Okay, so there's this uh, nice observation by Bradlow that if we just integrate V2 over our surface sigma, then on the left-hand side, we've got the integral of the curvature of a connection on a line bundle over sigma. That's a topological invariant. That's just two pi times the degree of the line bundle. And on the right-hand side, We've got the integral of this expression here, which is just half times tau times, so the integral of tau is just tau times the area of our surface. And this will be in my convention. Whenever I take a space and I place it between vertical straight lines, I mean the area or volume or measure or whatever, whatever the appropriate notion of size is for that set, okay? So that means area. Uh, minus, if I integrate that, I just get the L2 norm squared of my section, right? So from that, it follows that if I, have a, if I have a solution to this pair of equations, then I already know it's, I already know the L2 norm of the section phi, the Higgs field. Uh, it must be tau times the area of sigma minus four pi m. Okay, so that quantity is quite an important one. So let me call it, let me give it a name. I'm gonna call it epsilon, okay? And the thing to notice is, of course, it's, since it's the squared L2 norm of something, uh, it can't be negative. Okay, so this quantity epsilon uh, is definitely a non-negative number. Okay, so um, what do we know about the moduli space? So remember, Mn equals space of solutions of V1, V2 modulo gauge group. What do we know about it? Well, if epsilon is less than zero, we know it's empty by the argument I just uh, went through, right? Um, because
a, if you've got a solution, it's squared L2 norm has to be epsilon, right? And that can't be negative. Um, if epsilon is equal to, to zero on the other hand, well, then um, that's saying that the, uh, the L2 norm of, of our section phi is zero. <coughs> so phi is zero. And then the second equation here tells me that FA, so it tells me that my connection A has constant curvature. Okay, and no, that isn't a typo. That is how you spell connection with an X, okay? Um, well, on the two-sphere, and one of the nice things about working on two-sphere is that's unique up to gauge. Okay, and since we're modding out by the action of the gauge group, it follows that in this case, the modular space is just a single point. There's only one solution up to gauge. If epsilon is bigger than zero, well, then that's when it gets interesting and you have to try and prove the existence of solutions of this pair of equations. And there are multiple ways of doing that, but Bradlow and Oscar in their different ways. Uh, proved that in this case, solutions, are, 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 solutions up to gauge are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the divisor that phi um, uh, that phi defines on, on, on the surface, okay? The, the set of points uh, at which phi is zero, okay? So solutions modulo gauge are in one-to-one -one correspondence with degree n effective divisors. On sigma, okay? Uh, which let me remind you, that's just n a non ordered collection of n marked points on sigma, but you're allowed to have repeats, okay? And that, that is precisely the divisor defined by phi. So it's the set of points at which phi equals zero. Points at which phi equals zero. Okay, so um, from that, we see that the moduli space in general is just the n-fold symmetric product of, uh, of, of uh, the surface with itself. But in this particular case, and that's quite a complicated space in general, but because I'm restricting attention to the two sphere, there's a very nice explicit way of thinking about this space, which, which is very useful. Okay, so what we're saying is that solutions are one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence with collections of n marked points on my two sphere. I can always choose a stereographic coordinate of my two sphere. So for example, I could project from the South Pole. So now two spheres, uh, sorry, points in the two sphere are labeled by points in the Riemann sphere, right? The complex plane, but with a point added in infinity. So I've got N such points, let's call them Z1, Z2, up to Zn, okay? So how do I specify a collection of such points in a way which doesn't choose an ordering or whatever? Well, I just write down a polynomial of degree at most n, whose zeros are these points, okay? So I can write down P of Z equals, uh, I don't know how am I writing this? A naught plus A one Z plus A n Z to the n. So this is a polynomial of degree less than or equal to n. And the point is, the way it specifies the points is you just, you just um, associate the, the, the roots of this polynomial. So the divisor is just a set of roots of that polynomial. Okay, and if the degree is strictly less than n, all that means if, if the degree is n minus k, that just means you've got k copies of this point in your divisor, okay? But of course, the polynomial itself is not really what you want because if you multiply all the coefficients uh, by the same non-zero complex number, it doesn't move any of the roots. So we have to question out by that. Equivalence, okay? So this is, so solutions are one-to-one -one correspondence with polynomials modulo um, that obvious action of, of, C, of C star. So they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with, so vorte vortices are in one-to-one -one correspondence with projective equivalence classes of coefficients. Uh, of polynomials, right? The polynomials which 
the, 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 which the Higgs field vanishes. Okay, so from that we see that the moduli space is diffeomorphic to um, complex projective space of dimension n. Okay, good. The polynomial isn't allowed to vanish. So it's just, it's all, yeah, because then there aren't, that's a, that's a polynomial of degree minus infinity, isn't that something um, conventionally? So I guess I should say finite degree. Right. So the worst you can have is just a constant, which would just mean that all of the poles are, it's, uh, okay. Okay, good. So that's the moduli space. And as before, uh, we have an L2 metric on it. which you can define by a very high powered uh, Kähler quotient um, construction or whatever. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to think of it a bit more concretely than that. So let's just think about it. How do we do that? Well, what we want to do is we want to assign, what does a, what does a Riemannian metric do? It assigns lengths to tangent vectors, right? That's all it does. Anything which does that in, in an appropriate way defines a Riemannian metric. So let's take a curve in our moduli space, okay? So this is the space of solutions of the vortex equations modulo gauge, modulo the action of the gauge group. And what we want to do is we want to assign a squared length to the tangent vector that that curve defines, right? Curves define tangent vectors in the sense that's the definition of tangent vector. So how do we do this? Well, we think about, instead of thinking about MN, think about what I think Nuno is calling VN, the space of actual vortex solutions, not the moduli space, but the space before you quotient by the action of the gauge group. Okay, so I can always lift this to get a curve of actual vortex solutions. Okay, so this is, this is the space of vortex solutions and then there's a projection which is just quotienting out by the action of the gauge group. Right? But I don't just take any old lift because I don't want to measure, um, I don't want my metric to measure motion in the direction of the gauge orbits, right? Because that's not really moving, that's just changing gauge. So what I do is I change, I choose gauge in such a way that this lift is everywhere L2 orthogonal to the gauge orbits. Okay, so what that means in practice is I just demand that this curve satisfies Gauss's law. Okay, so given a, given a curve in the moduli space, I can always lift it to a curve in the space of vortex solutions which satisfies Gauss's law. Okay, satisfies this PDE. Um, and, and then by definition, this curve is moving orthogonal to the gauge orbits. Okay, and then I define its length, I define the length of this tangent vector to be the squared L2 norm of this tangent vector here. Okay. So let me call this vector here V, just to give it a name. Then GL2 of VV is by definition just the integral over sigma of phi dot squared plus a dot squared, um, where, as I say, I've chosen a lift which satisfies this, this orthogonality condition. Okay, and it's nice and it turns out to be Kähler. And that's not obvious from this definition, but it is true. Okay, and remember the low energy classical dynamics of vortices Well, if the classical dynamics is supposedly well approximated by geodesic motion, geodesic flow in MMG. Okay, so I've talked about that before and I've given you some intuition for why that, that will be true. Uh, what about if you're interested in quantum dynamics? Well, again, there's a very simple way of, of approaching that. We just quantize this classical dynamical system and there's a canonical quantization of that. So what we do is we define a wave function. So that's a time dependent complex valued function on my moduli space. And we say, we impose, we, we demand that it uh, satisfies Schrodinger's equation. And the obvious version of Schrodinger's equation here is where the Hamiltonian is just half h bar squared 
times the Laplace, times the Laplacian with respect to the L2 metric. Okay. Okay, so that's that's our Hamiltonian. So there's no A to us, B to us, Q to us, whatever. It's just very plain vanilla ordinary quantum mechanics. Okay, so why would you be interested in doing this for, for start? Why would you want to put vortices on a compact space, for example, a two sphere? Well, let's say you're interested in the thermodynamics of a gas of vortices. Then you really need to consider the, the regime where N, the degree, the number of vortices goes, goes to infinity, but in a controlled way where the density of vortices is fixed. Okay, so this is a nice, technically simple way of arranging that. So you can take, um, you can put them on a sphere, you can allow the size of the sphere to grow with N uh, linearly, or no, not linear, so the area grows linearly. Um, <coughs> uh, and therefore the vortex density will be fixed, but then you can consider taking N going to infinity and, and everything's nice and well-defined, you don't need boundary terms, um, and, and it's all well-behaved. Now, of course, you've got some choice, you could have chosen any compact space you like to do that trick. You didn't have to choose the two-sphere. And indeed, people have done it on more elaborate Riemann surfaces than that. But it turns out that the thermodynamics of the vortex gas doesn't care. It doesn't actually depend on the choice of genus. So there's really no point in, in making things more complicated, for this purpose at least. Okay, so that whole theme is going to be explained in a lot more detail by Nick Manson on Monday. Um, but let me just use this as a motivation to set up a couple of interesting calculations that you can do. So, so yeah, if you're interested in thermodynamics, um, what, how do you study thermodynamics? Well, the key thing you have to get your hands on is something called the partition wave. I don't really understand this, so I'm just gonna write it down. But it's a, it's a function of temperature, okay? And it's defined in the following way. It's e to the minus one half sum over your energy eigenvalues of energy eigenvalue divided by T, okay? So in this case, that's the same as sum over the spectrum of the laplace Beltrami operator, right, of uh, lambda, so h bar squared lambda over two, divided by T, where T is temperature. Okay, so to study the statistical mechanics of a system of n vortices moving on a two-sphere. Sorry? Is that right? Okay, I'll, I'll take your word for it. You can see how much I understand this particular part of the, uh, <laughs> the story. Uh, yes, that, 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 that does look more plausible to me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and it's probably, you're probably supposed to normalize it, and I've, I've forgotten that as well. Okay, so, yeah. What, what I'm going to say, all I'm going to say about this is, um, I mean, obviously, this is a very difficult thing to get your hands on, right? So to compute it, you need, first of all, you need to know the spectrum of the Laplacian, you don't actually have an explicit formula for the, for the metric, never mind the Laplacian. So how on earth are you going to find the eigenvalues of the Laplacian? It's kind of a bit hopeless um, in general. Okay, But on the other hand, if you're interested in the regime where T gets large, you can use heat kernel asymptotics to find a, an asymptotic expansion of this in terms of the small variable h bar squared over 2T. Okay, So if you think of that as being a small variable, then there's some classical asymptotic expansion for this quantity. Um, and if I get it wrong, probably someone in the audience will know, so I better get it right. So it's four pi divided by, so there's a bit that blows up. No, T is getting large, it's getting, yeah, it blows up. And then, and then there's, a, there's some coefficients. So there's a, a, a constant coefficient plus a linear coefficient in the small quantity plus higher order terms. And 
the interesting thing is that these two quantities here, they're, they're, they're geometric invariants of the, of the manifold on which the Laplacian is run. Okay, that's, that's a vacuous statement, of course. This only depends on the Laplacian, which only depends on the metric. So obviously these can only depend on the metric. What I mean by that is they're nice, easy geometric invariants of, of, the, of the space on which it's defined. So the first one is just the volume of the, of the space on which you're, you're working. And the second one is one half the Einstein Hilbert action, sorry, one sixth times the Einstein Hilbert action. Okay, where well, let me remind you that the Einstein Hilbert action is just the integral over the surf of the space of the scalar curvature. Okay, so you can't write down this partition function exactly. In fact, you can't write it down. You can't even get the definition right for me. Um, but if, you, if you're interested in the large T regime, then there's this asymptotic expansion, which you can, you can extract the first few terms if you know the, the volume of your moduli space and the einstein hilbert action of the moduli space. Okay, so this, on the face of it, doesn't look that encouraging because, of course, we don't have an explicit formula for the metric. So if we don't have a formula for the metric, how on earth can we compute the volume of the moduli space? And how can we compute its einstein hilbert action? But it turns out that here, Durham cohomology is our friend. And even though we don't know ex exactly what the, what the metric is, um, we can deduce the volume that the metric defines and, the, and its einstein hilbert action in the absence of, a, of an actual explicit formula for the metric. Okay, so that's next up. On the agenda. Okay, so exact computation of the volume of MN. So this is using ideas of Manton and Nazir from quite a while ago. Okay, so the point is the following. Uh, the, the volume of the manifold is, of course, just the integral of its volume form. And the volume form of a Kähler manifold is just its Kähler form to the power m divided by n factorial. Okay? Now, the thing about this, uh, the thing about this formula, because this is a compact, this is compact and it doesn't have a boundary, uh, that, that integral only depends, only cares about the cohomology class, the Durham cohomology class of omega. It doesn't care about the, the form itself, right? Because if I switch omega to omega tilde to something in its in its um, in the same cohomology class, Durham cohomology class, clearly omega to the n also goes to plus something exact, right? Okay. So if I shift this in its cohomology class. Uh, the difference that that generates is, is, is exact, and then I'm integrating it over a compact space with no boundary. So the, the difference in the integral disappears, okay? So this only depends on the Durham cohomology class. Okay, and I will, for the first time, I will put DR. All the cohomology groups I wrote down, they're just Durham cohomology, which is nothing fancy going on, okay? Uh, yeah, by Stokes system. Okay, good. Well, we're in luck, right? Because we happen to restrict our attention to the case where the surface is a two sphere. So the moduli space is PN. So what's the second Durham cohomology group of PN? It's just the reals. Okay, so let me choose a generator for that. So choose a generator. Omega naught. So what is that? That's just a that's just a cohomology, a Durham cohomology class of two forms. Um, Normalize so that the integral 
of omega zero or any form in its class in this class over a generating CP one. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that in a minute is equal to one. Okay. So by a generating CP one, I mean, a P one, which generates the second homology group of, 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 C, of, of, of MM, um, which in the coordinate system that we're dealing with these, um, so by identifying this literally PM, I can think of it as being the following Z zero, Okay, so there's a natural embedding of P1 into Pn, where I just stick Pn, P1 into the first two entries, right? That's what I mean by the generating uh, one cycle um, for, for Mn. Okay, so I've chosen a generator for my um, second Durham cohomology group of my moduli space in that way. Then whatever the cohomology class of the L2, Taylor form is, is some multiple of that, right? Um, and if I want to find out what that alpha is, well, it's just the integral over this generating one cycle of omega L2. But then if I know that number there, which in fact, it's precisely the area with respect to the L2 metric of this generating um, of this generating one cycle, right? Um, then what's the volume of Mn? Well, it's just the integral, because this thing only depends on the cohomology class of omega, I can replace omega by alpha omega zero, right? So that's alpha over n factorial integral over mn of omega zero to the n. Okay, but we know about the ring structure of the cohomology group, of the, of the cohomology of, uh, of, uh, of, of Pn, right? So omega zero to the n generates, it's a, it's a, it's a generator of the nth cohomology of the top, co the two nth cohomology of Pn. So this, this integral here by the ring structure of the cohomology of, uh, of Pn, is one. Okay, so I can compute the volume. It's just alpha to the n over n factor, or provided I can compute this number here. Right? Okay, so let's just kick the can a little bit further down the road. How do I actually compute that number there? Well, this is where Nick Manson had a nice idea. We're not going to think about this generating one, uh, two cycle. We're going to think about a different uh, two dimensional sphere sitting inside MN. Okay, so let's consider the set, call it MN co, co for co centered, of co centered N vortices. Um, okay, so in other words, vortex solutions where the divisor is just a single point n times. Yeah? So phi equals n times a single point. Okay, so that is obviously just given, it's diffeomorphic to a two sphere, right? It's just given by a single point. Uh, it's specified by a single point on the two sphere. If I, want to, if I want to think about it in terms of this identification with Pn, what's, this, what's the set of polynomials in a stereographic coordinate I should be looking at? Well, it's the polynomials that look like this. Okay. So I can, I can expand that out, z to the n minus n, q to the n minus one, uh, sorry, n to the, as n q z to the n minus one hundred. Sorry. Okay. All right. So this thing, as I say, it's diffeomorphic to a two sphere, uh, and so is the generating two cycle that I wrote down here. That one there. 
uh, but they're not homologous to one another, okay? Because if you want to figure out um, the homology class of this, what you should do is you should compute its intersections with a generic hyperplane. And if you do that, you'll find, because this is a degree n polynomial in Q, you'll get n, n intersections, okay? So by thinking about intersections of this uh, S2 uh, with a generic hyperplane, you see it intersects generically n times. Um, so this is not homologous to, to this, this um, generating two cycle, which only intersects a generic plane once. Um, I'm not sure. Um, so this thing is homologous to n copies of P1 zero. Yeah, well, yeah, just, just take those to be the coefficients of my polynomial, I guess. So I haven't thought about that, to be honest, what, what, what exactly I mean by that. But yeah, take, take those to be the coefficients of my polynomial. Where did I write it down? So it's Z0 uh, plus Z1 Z, right? So yeah, I guess N minus one. Um, so yeah, this generating, this generating cycle has M minus one vortices at the projection point, and the other one moves around the sphere, however it likes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where was I up to? There. Okay. So anyway, yeah. A key observation is that this this two sphere of co-centered vortices is homologous to n copies of this generator uh, cycle. Okay. So if I integrate the Kähler form over that. Okay, where am I to? So, okay, so this differs from n copies of m zero by something which is the boundary of something, right? And then again by Stokes's theorem, that term is irrelevant. So this is n times the integral of omega L2 over the generating two cycle, yeah? And remember, this is the thing that we're calling alpha. Okay, so this, is the, this is the quantity we want to know. So the point is that alpha is just one over N times the integral of omega L2 over that. In other words, times the area of this space of co-centered vortices. Okay, so we still need to compute this though, right? So how on earth do we do that? Well, now this localization formula, which I kind of rushed a bit towards the end of last lecture, um, comes to the rescue. So although we can't write down an absolutely explicit formula for the metric, we do have this localization formula, which gives us enough insight into the metric, gives us enough information about the metric that we can compute this integral exactly. Okay, so let me remind you about localization calculation. So before, so previously, what we did is we took a curve of static n vortex solutions in the plane. Okay, so here our metric was just dz dz bar, and we imagined that the zeros were all distinct, and we allowed them to move along arbitrary curves, okay? And we computed the kinetic energy of that, but always assuming that they obey Gauss's law, okay? We've got a formula for the kinetic energy. Okay? And it's quite a complicated business, but there is a well-defined way of doing it and, it, and, the, and, and you get the formula you get. Okay, so now we're gonna do something very similar, except we're gonna consider the situation that we're on a two-sphere, not necessarily the round two-sphere. So our metric is just gonna be some conformal factor written in terms of a stereographic coordinate. 
Okay. Now we're just going to take a single point, let's call it Q, n times, and allow that to, to depend on time. Okay. Other than that, the calculation is exactly the same. It's exactly analogous. We work in a local coordinate, a local um, um, isothermal coordinate chart, do exactly the same calculation I outlined on the plane, and you, can, and you get this localization formula. You find out that the kinetic energy can be determined entirely in terms of the behavior of the Higgs field close to the position where the thing vanishes, which in this case is just a single point, but with degeneracy n. Okay? So how does this work? How does the formula work? Well, you have to think about this quantity here, the log of the squared norm of, uh, of, of your Higgs field. And what you do is you think about the behavior of that quantity close to the point where uh, the Higgs field is vanishing, okay? So because the Higgs field is vanishing, this by definition is gonna have some um, logarithmic singularity, which uh, conventionally you don't put two pi in front of it. That was a mistake, and you know was right in the last lecture. There's, there's no factors of two pi there. Um, okay, and then the remainder, after you subtracted off that singularity is actually a nice smooth function, okay? So you can expand it. Okay, so that, that's just, this is just some quantity depending on Q and Q, it's just some function of Q position, okay? And so is this, okay? So this is just a complex valued function. Okay. It turns out we don't, we don't actually care about that. It doesn't tell us anything useful. This one does, okay? Z bar minus, yes, thank you. Yeah, very good. Keep me honest, Nuno, please do. Okay, so by going through this localization process that I have in the last time, you can, you can actually write down a formula for the kinetic energy of this, of this field configuration where n coincident velocities just move along some, some, some curve Q, okay, where you choose gauge so that they satisfy Gauss's law. And what you end up with is a half n pi times tau times the conformal factor evaluated at the position plus twice dB by dQ bar. So the partial derivative of this quantity here with respect to Q bar times the length squared of Q dot. All times the square of Okay, so that's just a calculation. It's, it's not easy, but it's it's well established, and one can do it. Okay, so of course you still don't know what this thing is b, right? I mean, and there's no way of getting hold of it unless you assume that the the two sphere is round, and then you can actually compute b using symmetry arguments, and that's what Nick Manton originally did. But then Nazir came along and came up with a smarter way of proceeding. Or between them, they did. Um, okay, so from that, we get an expression for the Kähler form. Okay, so the Kähler form, at least restricted, of course, this is only on the, uh, on this two sphere of coincident velocities. It's I n pi by two. Well, let, let me jump all the way to the, to the end. is tau times n times pi times the area form on sigma, right? Well, yeah, you don't really mean the area form on sigma. You mean there's an obvious, there's an obvious diffeomorphism from sigma to mn co, right? Which maps a point uh, on sigma to the point where all the vortices are at that point. See what I mean? Okay, so using that obvious diffeomorphism, you can think of this as being a two form on mn co, right? Um, minus i n pi, times the d bar exterior derivative of that form, b to q. Okay. So if you, that, that follows immediately from this. You can probably see it, right? Okay, so let's give this, for, this, let's give this form here um, a name. Let's call it beta. It's a one zero form. Okay. Well, of course, by dimensional grounds, there aren't any um, 
there aren't any two zero forms on a two dimensional, <laughs> on a one dimensional complex manifold. So actually, if I like, I can replace this by just the ordinary exterior differential, right? Because on, on degree grounds, D of this is going to be zero, right? Because it's a zero two form on a one manifold, so that's zero. Okay, so this, in the end, I get this nice formula. Maybe even better if I'd write this. Okay, good. Well, that was all in this coordinate charts where I projected from the South Pole. Okay, what if I do exactly the same calculation, but I instead of project from the North Pole? So this, this form, beta, is defined on one of the two coordinate charts defining uh, on S2, right? So let's repeat the calculation. on U1, which is S2 with the North Pole. Okay, so I introduce a new coordinate, Z tilde equals one over Z, and my vortex position now is one over Q, okay? But I can define H in exactly the same way, right? So H equals log of phi squared, it's N log, of whoops z tilde minus one over q squared plus some other coefficient a tilde plus one half b tilde z tilde minus one over q plus complex conjugate plus higher order terms okay and that's the same h it's, it's, it's exactly the same quantity i'm talking about the same solution okay so now i just remember that z tilde is one over z And I expand this expression, you know, in, in, in Z minus Q, okay? And then I compare with the previous version. Okay, and in that way, I can figure out just by expanding this in Z minus Q and extracting the linear term, right? I can figure out an expression for B tilde in terms of B, right? Okay, and the interesting thing is you get, you don't, it's not the obvious transformation you would think, and that's precisely because of this logarithmic divergence right here. What you find is that B tilde is two times N times Q minus Q squared B, okay? So you don't know what this thing B is, you don't know what B tilde is, but you know the relationship between them just by doing this very simple change of coordinate. Okay, so from that, we can figure out what the expression for this one, this zero one form is B to tilde. Okay, so what is that? Well, that's B times the differential of the position of your of your vortex, but in this new coordinate system. So that's B times the differential of one over Q. Okay. Which is the same as, if you, if you compute it, beta plus two N over Q. Okay. All right, so what have we got here? We've got, we've got a one form, a, 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 a one form beta, defined on this part of the T-sphere. And we've got another one form beta tilde defined in, on this part of the T-sphere. And on the intersection, they're related in this way. Right? Okay, well, that's precisely the local data of a connection on the line bundle O2N over, uh, over the T-sphere, okay? So what's OK? So this is the line bundle, degree K line bundle, holomorphic line bundle. Uh, 
over the two sphere, which has a trivialization, which has trivialization. Trivialization. So U naught cross C. So you just take trivial bundles over U naught and U1 and you glue them together with transition function G01 um, map from U0 intersect U1 to CX, uh, G01 of Z equals Z to the K. Okay? So by OK, I just, I just mean the, the, line, the holomorphic line bundle over the two sphere whose transition function in this obvious trivialization is Z to the K. All right, so the point is, if I think about that bundle and I think about an arbitrary connection on that bundle and how, it is, how it's represented locally by forms, I, I get precisely a pair of forms looking like this, whose, whose relationship is, is this. Okay, so beta and beta tilde, you find a connection on O2M. So in general, on OK, this, would, this, this coefficient would be OK. All right, so let's call that thing, well, let's call it beta. And of course, d beta, so beta is only, you know, the one form beta is only locally well defined, but its exterior differential is perfectly well defined. It's the curvature of that connection. Okay. So what I found is that the L2, the L2 norm on, sorry, the L2, the L2 Kähler form restricted to the subspace of co-centered n vortices is tau times n times pi times the Kähler form on my surface minus n times pi times i times the curvature of this connection. Okay. And now by churn veil theory, whatever, um, the, 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 the Durham cohomology class of this is, uh, is fixed, right? We know what it is. So it follows from that, that the integral over mn co of omega L2 is just tau times n times pi times the integral of that, which is the area of the surface, minus n times pi times two pi times the degree of this, of this of the line bundle on which this is a connection, which is two n, which is pi, n times pi times tau sigma minus four pi. Hmm, interesting. Okay, and remember that was this crucial coefficient times alpha. So that allows me to figure out what alpha is. So I just divide by n. And from that, I get that the volume of the modular space, remember that was alpha to the n over n factorial. It's just pi to the n times tau sigma minus four pi n to the n divided by n factorial. Okay, or more briefly, it's pi to the n, epsilon to the n of n factorial. Okay, so that is a, I think that's a really neat result. Um, and you see it made great use of this localization formula, which at first sight you think, well, what use is it? It's an explicit formula, but involving something which you don't know explicitly. But it turns out that just knowing the structure of this thing is good enough to deduce non-trivial uh, consequences. Okay, so uh, let me just briefly finish off with the second one. So the Einstein-Hilbert action. What is that? Um, so that's the integral of the scalar curvature of MN. Well, the scalar curvature is the trace of the Ricci form. Uh, we can always define the, the Ricci, sorry, trace the Ricci scale, uh, the Ricci tensor, I not really sure. I can always define the Ricci form in the same way that I get the Kähler form from the metric. And it turns out that's a closed two form. Um, and then I can think of the curvature as just being the pointwise inner product, the scalar curvature is the pointwise inner product of row with the Kähler form. I guess this is pointwise. Okay, 
So this is the same as the integral, it's, it's the same as the L2 inner product of rho with the L2 k with rho, which is the same as the integral over mn of rho wedge over L2 to the n minus one over n minus one factor, right? So you wedge it with the Hodge dual of the of omega, which is which is that thing there. Okay, so as we've already already observed, integrals like this, because this is compact without boundary, only care about the cohomology class of the things involved. We already know the cohomology class of that. What was it? I L sigma. Okay, so if we could figure out the cohomology class of that, we'd be in business, right? Uh, but actually, we do know the cohomology class of that. Because although this is, I've, I've presented it as the uh, Ricci form of a Kähler metric, there's an alternative way of thinking of it. So consider the following line bundle. So there's a complex line bundle. So what you do is you take the top exterior product of, sorry, holomorphic of the, of the holomorphic tangent space with itself. Say that n times. Okay, so that's uh, that's a complex line bundle, right? Spanned by well, yeah, it's a complex line bundle. Um, it's sometimes I think it's called the anti-canonical bundle, the dual of the canonical bundle. Anyway, I think that's what they mean by the anti-canonical. Um, okay, so this is a complex line bundle over M n. Um, it inherits from the Levi-Civita connection a connection. And so what we have is a complex line bundle with a connection. Um, it has a curvature. It turns out that the curvature of this connection that it inherits is precisely rho. So remember, this is a, a two form, right? On, on, my, on my manifold. Um, it's precisely the curvature of this connection. And that's very special to Kähler manifolds, right? You're, you're using the fact that the manifold is Kähler all over the place. Okay, so again, by churn veil theory, we know what the cohomology, uh, what, the, what the, the Ram cohomology class of this uh, thing is. Since it's, a, since it's the curvature of a connection on the anti-canonical bundle, it's equal to the first churn class of that bundle. Okay, so now you just need to know what the first string class of the um, anti-canonical bundle of your space is. And for MN, for um, it turns out that this is isomorphic to ON plus one, okay? So from that, you get the integral over a generating, Cycle of that is that. Okay, so it, it follows that. Um, yeah. The Durham cohomology class of the Ricci form is is this number here. Okay? Is this form is this class here? Okay, so from that we can get that the Einstein-Hilbert action of M N is. Uh, just two pi n plus one times pi to the n minus one to the n minus one over n minus one factorial times the integral of omega zero to the n over mn, but of course, by definition, that's one. So that means these, the first two terms in this asymptotic expansion of the partition function, you can compute them explicitly. And that is where I will stop. Okay, let's thank Martin. Any questions?
Let's thank Martin one more time.